then we'll get started. All right, tell you what, it's three after, we're going to get started. Uh, let's see, two more so far. All right, um, I don't see Rachel on the call, so I can't nag her about her AI. We could do that offline. All right, um, okay, community time. I don't see Ivan on the call, so I'm not quite sure what to do with his suggestion for a topic. Um, other than I think he's the same person who may have pinged uh, the group during uh, in a Slack session, asking for people who may want to present at Ukrainian conferences. Uh, you may want to look for him on Slack if you're interested in doing that. So just mentioning that. Uh, let's see, moving forward, SDK work group. I don't believe anything is going on there other than if you are part of the group that's working on SDK, <clears throat> we are hoping to do some sort of interoperability demo showcase thingy at KubeCon EU. Um, but I think the biggest hurdle in doing that is we want people to try to show interoperability across all the various versions of the spec, not just the very latest version. So we may need a lot of updates from uh, the SDK authors out there. So please, um, if you guys do have an SDK, please mention your interest in participating in that in the SDK Slack channel so we can start organizing something there. Uh, Scott or Mark, can you guys think of anything else SDK related that I'm forgetting to mention? Okay, moving on then. Scott has been doing a ton of massive changes on the Go SDK and it's looking, looking really good. I also broke a bunch of issues out into the the issue area. So if you want to come help, come pick up an issue or talk to me. There you go. All right. Uh, moving on, Scott or um, Doug, would you guys like to bring us up on where we are on the demo work? I think um, I, I can take a pass at it and then maybe Doug can fill it in, but we we had a meeting with uh, Heathrow or Heathrow was in attendance and uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly how uh, Arcus and the airport can be worked in so that vendors can participate in a demo that's uh, actually shows what we're trying to show at a, like a, a KubeCon like event. So we're, we're still trying to figure out exactly what the demo should be. Um, Doug, anything you want to add to that? Because I think the only other thing worth probably worth adding is you had an action item to come back on next Monday's phone call with a um, <clears throat> with a more detailed description of the exact scenario and, and the various role that participants, participants can play in the demo itself, right? Yeah, I, I had uh, emailed you and Scott last night. Um, I thought for uh, the interact the interaction part of the demo. So looking for your feedback before I I move forward with some of those um, um, specific uh, specific conditions and actions that would be part of the workflow. But it it, it the uh, the main, um, yeah, it, it was all about being role based. I think is what we we agreed on, so that the attendees could um, select a particular role that they wanted to play in a collaborative um, workflow process that involved um, some manual test tasks that the participants would uh, perform, combined with uh, automation through microservices. And, and, and all of that would, it, all the interactions would be um, through um, content, uh, contextual content passed in cloud events. Yep. Okay, any questions on that? All right, cool. So thank you, Doug, and look forward to uh, reading the note you sent last night and then the Monday's phone call. Sounds like it should be fun. 
All right, moving forward, uh, Kukan EU. Um, the last time we had a conversation or a meeting about that, most people were busy with other stuff, so there hasn't been a lot of progress there, but people aren't stressing too much yet. So we decided to take a little bit of break and, and come back in a couple of weeks. Uh, the one thing I will point out though, is there is work planning on being done, an update in the white paper and the landscape doc from the serverless working group. Uh, I think Scott and two other people, I can't remember who are taking the leads on that. Um, so, but if you are interested in making updates to those docs, please reach out to me or, um, or Scott and we'll get you in contact with the other folks so we can coordinate the activities there. All right. Um, let's see, nothing about KuCon China. I then I request the session. So let's go ahead and jump into PRs. Unfortunately, bu -bu -bu -bum, I don't see Christoph on the call. So that, oh wait, no, I don't see him. That's gonna be a challenge. So let's skip those until, actually Tapini's not there either. So Clemens, you may be up first. Um, let me just think about this for that. Okay, yeah, Clemens, did you want to talk about this PR? Yes. Well, that's that's been a while. Um, yeah, and I think there might be some outstanding comments for you. Okay, well, let me go to the other view. Hold on a sec. Yeah, go to that. Um, no, not that one. I think this one. I think Evan was just pointing out you may need a constraint section. Ah. Yeah, that's probably that's probably better from an editorial perspective to go and put that into the constraint section. Yeah, but I believe that's more syntactical. So I, I think the broader question for the group is: is the general? Let me. I thought I hit it. Honestly. So let so let me let me just summarize that for the group. Um, yeah, where this comes from. Um, this was raised by uh, Alan Conway, and uh, because he's been trying to do some. Um, uh, intermediary work and uh, what he found is that he is he looked at a uh, data field and couldn't figure out what that was whether that contains um, you know, binary content or whether that contained some string that he was uh, had to interpret so we've been effectively picking up the um, the content encoding um, uh, field from um, uh, from MIME, and which is also used in HTTP, um, and basically label the data field. In addition, so there's the the content type, which says this is what is in there, and the data content encoding now says, and this is how this is encoded. So if it's a string based encoding, um, as it is with JSON, you say uh, this is base sixty four encoded binary. We basically declare with that that the data field, if it's a string, um, then you know it's a base64 encoded binary. That's what that's for. And it's optional, it means you only provide it when, um, um, and I, I, I just missed, missed adding these, uh, um, these other fields, like what it is, whether it's optional, and then the constraints, things in editorial, that's editorial wise, that's correct. But that's what the function is. Right. So I, I, as we talked about, obviously there's some syntactical things that need to be changed here, but yeah. from a semantic perspective, what do people on the call think about this? Does it sound like it's headed in the right direction? And I didn't see any complaints about it in the PR itself over the last two weeks or so. Anybody have any concerns? It'll help a lot, actually. That's a good comment. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Okay. All right, not hearing any complaints then. It sounds like it's just a matter of minor editorial thing and then we can hopefully maybe approve that next week. Okay, let me, I'll, I'll clean that up. Excellent, thank you, sir. Um, next, primer edits. This one is yours as well, Clemens. So let me, I'm not sure if you had a chance to talk to this one yet or not. So let's, maybe you should do that first. 
Yeah, I've um, and I have not read the comments just because of uh, uh, being busy and sick and all this. Um, th this is effectively the um, an explanation of something that we haven't had yet in the spec, and that's um, how the the spec set is actually layered on top of each other. So there's the base spec. We have extensions that go and layer on top of the base spec. There's format encodings. Um, and then we have the transport bindings. Um, and then effectively just this explains how the stuff is all layered on top of each other. Um, and, and you will also find these dependencies in the, in the SDKs. And there's a similar section with a bit of a different wording in the SDK doc um, that kind of gives guidance on how the object model should hang together. Um, and that's kind of reflective of that base layering that we have in the specs. So that makes the basic the basic architecture model that I've been like I, when I wrote the initial set of of encodings and and, and transport binding specs. That's kind of the the model that I had in my head, and so this is the first time that I actually wrote that down. Yeah. Any questions or comments on this? Okay, I'm not hearing any. Can't remember if there are any comments in the PR itself. So I think these are more editorial. Um, did you want to try to address these comments from Christoph? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll look through those too. Okay. Um, you mean right now? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, yeah. offline. I just was yeah, wondering whether you want. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering whether, whether you thought he was totally wrong and just wanted to push forward without those edits or not. Um, no, I'll 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 uh, I'll address those. Okay, cool. So if I'm not hearing any complaints, then maybe next week we can approve those yeah. going forward. Thank you, sir. Um, I don't know if this one's actually ready. I don't think it is, but let's double check. Yeah, I think this one saw some discussion. So this one is about trying to <clears throat> figure out what the uniqueness aspect is of our properties. Um, and I believe he's headed in the general direction of saying that ID and source are the unique aspects of cloud events. And in particular, so I was talking about how if those are the same, um, the receiver can then treat them as duplicates if it wants to do some, do some deep deduping logic. Um, while the discussion is still going on, I wanted to get a sense from the group here in terms of what you guys thought about this general direction. Um, I know there are some people raising concerns about trying to do anything in this space at all, but I wanted to hear or wanted to open up for discussion if you guys want to talk about it. I would see it as ID source and event type. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think they, that they have, someone actually might have suggested that at one point too in the PR itself. Oh, it's user error on my part on, on what? Okay, uh, Scott, can I get you to make a comment to that effect in the PR itself, just to get that conversation going? Sure. Okay, cool, thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Does it seem like this is something we, we definitely want to add to the spec? Yes, I, I think it helps to uh, avoid further confusion. Okay. At least to have a position on it, yeah, that we can point to. Okay, thank you, Jim. Anybody else want to comment? Okay. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll I'll make a comment that if we're if we're talking about multiple fields, should it be talked about at in, via the ID or do we just need to put it into a different section? Oh, I see what you mean. Just from a syntactical perspective, should it be uh, outside of one particular thing? Right. Oh, that's an interesting point. Because I, th I think that we have best practices somewhere. Yeah, we may. Um, yes, it, especially if it depends on whether it's normative. Yeah, because it does have some normative text here, so that would mean it stays in the spec itself as opposed to going to the primer. You want to make a comment to that effect in the PR, Mark? 
Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, seeing some plus ones in the chat. Thank you, guys. Okay, anybody else want to comment on this? I'm not hearing anybody object to heading this direction, so that's good. Okay. Um, in that case, boy, I wish Christoph was here because I really wanted to talk about his minimum supported thing. Um, so, Christoph, okay, let's, I'm not, obviously, I don't want to talk too much about it because he's not here. However, I do want to make sure you guys are aware that he has made some changes into this PR itself. And um, taking my chair hat off for a sec, I think this is a fairly serious change to spec. I mean, by serious, I don't mean good or bad, just it's a, it's a significant change. Um, and I would really, really like people to take a look at it to make sure that they're okay with this direction or if they have concerns to raise those concerns. I, I don't want this one to be silent equals consent kind of a thing. This is, this, is a, this is a pretty big change in my opinion, but maybe I'm wrong. So please take a look at this when you get a chance. Is there anybody who'd like to talk about it now though, even though Christoph is not on the call? I have something that I want to tell. Okay. And here at Itahu, we are implementing cloud events at version 1.0.1 uh, as a starting point. And we already have exceeded 20 characters long for the source attribute. So I don't think that it would be a very good rule. So I don't know. Because we have a lot of systems here. If we don't, uh, if we don't specify which service is creating that event, we don't have the capability to know where it came from. It's it's not twenty characters for the key, uh, the value. It's twenty characters for the key in this PR. Well, that's what I was just checking. So the source is a URI reference, and URI references should not exceed 2K. Ah, oh, okay. So I misunderstood. Sorry. Okay. But having direct implementation experience is always good. <laughs> so you're, you're testing this, which is good. Okay. Anybody else? So I, I've not seen this before. Uh, is there any reason why the size came down, the overall size came down to 45K? I thought we had a bigger number than that. I don't recall. I'm wondering if it's, speaking, that's the I'm attributes. I was hoping that that would uh, keep, that would give some grace, uh, that would keep it below the 64K. Oh, so it's sort of giving you some headroom, yeah? yeah. Yeah, the, the idea is that uh, he wants to kind of guarantee to a user that's submitting a event in their kind of native uh, format um, that when it gets then serialized and sent across the wire, it will successfully proceed through a series of middleware and, and end up at the end consumer uh, predictably. And, and having some, some headroom there uh, helps ensure that if the uh, encoding increases the bit by size. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Eric. I, I still think it's an extreme amount of effort for the, the re-encoding case. Uh, and also now, now you're actually, you, you, with a single event, you can violate, you know, I don't know how many, I haven't counted the rules, but there's a lot of rules you can now violate that you all need to be aware of, of the quotas that you have. Um, which could be a little frustrating. So, Clarence, will we, will we proposing this as a hard thing or just as an interop thing if you really wanted to guarantee you know, uh, stuff would work across boundaries? I, I, would, I would be, yeah, so there's a should. Um, I, I'm, I still, I'm still okay with, with basically saying 
64K wire size encoding is okay. There's a there's a comment to that effect actually um, in, in the comment section, uh, which is 64K wire size is is the limit, and and how you get there is ultimately up to you. And and if the publisher gives you an event encoded, and you're middleware, then um, unless you are re-encoding, you should go and just forward that, that event as is, right? So, so yeah, re-encoding sh should, might go and make the event a little larger. Um, but I prefer that risk to doing all that math and having to enforce 20 rules, which could be pretty frustrating if you just have that one long string field um, and have a, a monstrous long URI, which pr probably uh, uh, even in, in, uh, includes a token or whatever, whatever we need there. Um, and then you can't do that because, you know, even though you are under the limit for the event size, um, that one particular field is constrained. So all of these, because, you know, the, the, limit, the limit is always, the limit we set here is arbitrary uh, of 64K. Um, but now we have not only one arbitrary limit, we have like 10. Yeah, that, that, that's the part that worried me was all the rules involved and someone, someone's gonna look at this and say, oh my gosh, what, do I, what am I signing up for? Anybody else wanna comment on this? Okay, so Clemens, I don't know if you've made a comment yet, but if you haven't, can you please comment with your with what you just said into the PR itself? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, any other discussion points on this one before we move on? All right, I think that's it for the PRs themselves. Um, I think Tapini is still working on his. What I wanted to do now was talk about some of the security issues because um, our next milestone has a requirement they're supposed to resolve all known security concerns or issues. Um, so this one is about encrypting the cloud event data attributes. And do do do. Um, I was wondering, okay, based upon the comments in this issue, um, I think between uh, Evan, Jim, and at least one other person in there. Um, I put together this very rough outline of a proposal just to get the ball rolling on this. Um, and then Eric, I know you, you wanted to maybe do some wording smith, wordsmith on it. Um, but I was wondering what people thought about this general direction. I'll give you guys a second to actually read that. It's this comment here. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was slow commenting. I, I wanted to wordsmith you know, um, bullet point three, because um, I, I think a bit after the, uh, after the comma could be dropped altogether. Well, this is not, this is not a pro proposal. This is just, yeah, yeah. are you yeah, okay with the fine. general direction? I get it. Yeah, no, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah I like that too. Okay. All right, um, is there anybody who wants to volunteer to turn this into a formal pull request? Um, I'll do that if nobody else wants to. Excellent, thank you, Jim. Hold on, I appreciate that. Otherwise I was gonna feel obligated to do that. Oops. Just from a point of order, do, where, which part of the spec would you see this sitting in? Um, out of interest? Or do you just want me to take a stab? Um, I don't think we have a security section yet. So maybe this will be the first thing to go into a security section. Okay. Does that sound right to people? Okay, not hearing any complaints. All right, cool. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. All right, next issue. <clears throat> Do, 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 do need to be really event context. Um, okay, so um, so Klaus is going to do a PR based on what's been going on in here. Uh, but Klaus, would you like to summarize sort of the direction that you're going to head? Well, just to see what people think about it. 
question was if, if um, any um, um, middleware can um, somehow modify um, event attributes and, and or if there are any rules for this. And um, well, over the discussion, you, you can see this has been opened already in August, so um, it's an old issue already. Um, I think we, we uh, are the people who discussed kind of agreed that there are a lot of cases and it's, it's different, difficult to uh, define very strict rules on this, but um, that maybe some note in the primer would be uh, good to um, uh, emphasize that there are certain restrictions on the attributes, like for example, what we had a few minutes ago with a source and ID that should also be um, kept when someone in the middle is somehow uh, modifying attributes. Or maybe another one, if the time attribute is updated, like, like Evan posted, um, then it should be assumed that it's a new uh, event and then also the ID should be another one, things like this. Okay. So try to collect some of those and then for, uh, put them in some um, section for the primer, I suppose, and then we can discuss. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments for uh, for Klaus? Does it seem like putting some text into the primer is the right direction for people? Is there anybody who thinks that maybe we some we need something uh, normative to go into the spec itself? Or we can wait till we see the text and see what people think. Okay, not hearing anybody. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm gonna take silence as consent, Klaus. So if you could do the PR for that, we can move forward on that one. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, next one. I think this one actually, Eric, is this yours? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we don't need to cover this one, right, Eric? This is already covered by the other one we talked about? Agreed. Okay, cool, thank you. <clears throat> um, let's see, okay, this one. Doo -doo -doo. All right, Adam, this one's yours. Would you like to introduce this issue? Sure, so uh, <clears throat> to give some background, I work on the Knative eventing piece, which uses cloud events as kind of the interop uh, between all of our different servers. And I had looked at the spec, written up a curl command that followed it exactly, and then realized that none of the libraries we used actually worked with it. And tracked down the problem to the spec specifying in HTTP binary mode, the, any string in a header value should be surrounded by double quotes. But none of the implementations I came across, which concretely were only two distinct Go implementations, actually respected that. They always interpreted the quotes into the value itself rather than removing them. And uh, the, some people I've talked to basically said this looks like a spec bug rather than um, an implementation bug. I just wanted clarity on which one it is and if it is a spec bug, we should go back and fix it because all the current examples uh, basically state these have to be present and have to be removed, but no implementation I can find actually does so. Okay. So my question is for Clemens, because I think you may have actually been the person to write this up. And I think this came around because of some language in the spec that talks about doing adjacent encoding on values and stuff. Mm. But was it really your intention to include quotes as the headers or in the headers itself? No. I didn't think so. So you're open to a PR that removes these quotes, right? Yes, okay. I am. That was not the intent, but that's a great, fa fabulous bug. <laughs> yes, it's also a humorous that no one noticed it till now. That, that's true. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's why we're doing all this testing stuff, right? This is great. Yeah. No, I love it. It's just, it's just amusing to me because, you know, I'm sure everybody's looked at the examples in the spec and they looked at the double quotes and just, you know, just sort of ignored them. <laughs> yeah, you read through them effectively. <laughs> exactly. It just amused me. Okay. Maybe that means we need to have uh, examples as curl commands versus uh, this kind of undefined uh, printout. Uh, you know what would be really cool is if there was some way in Markdown to do like an include, and that way we could have test cases that actually run on the, on some, you know, on this file basically, 
and, and that can do a curl with it, but then also sucks it into the markdown. And you don't have to do some weird copy and paste thing mm. that gets out of sync. Yes. No, we are getting into the wonderful world of documentation <laughs> infrastructure. I know. If, if only this was HTML, you know? Anyway. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, so I apologize, Adam. I couldn't remember. Assign that, assign that bug to me. There we go. Okay, that's what I was looking for, an owner. Well, of course. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether Adam wanted to sign up for that exciting piece of work, but no. If you want to do it, Clemens, go and, for it. And then if we end up, if we're switching the spec, is this going to be retroactive to 0.1 and 0.2 as well, or only 0.3 and above? Um, so far, but nobody has cared and has uh, been able to read events anyways. Um, Yes, I think everything is everything moving forward. Um, I'm wondering if it would be worthwhile to make a note, not in the old version of the spec, but somewhere in our documentation that says, we noticed there's a typographical error um, in the previous versions of the spec while we're not updating it. Implement, implementers should be aware of the, of the error and you know, basically remove the quotes. Yes. So maybe you can- No, no, there's, there's text that explicitly says to quote things. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I don't want to go back and create. Do, do you guys want to actually want to go back and update the specs themselves? You want to have interop on the 01 and 02? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question as well, but- uh, I, I, I think of all of these as working drafts. Um, and uh, uh, I think once, once we have 1.0, we can we can go back and make errata, but I'm not sure we we need to do that on on, on the older ones. I mean, we can always we can always go update the old tags, but so let, let's pause here for a minute because this is a discussion that came up in the SDK call. I think it was last week, where there was a whole question of you know people actually have uh, running code in production of the current versions of the spec in some some form or another. Mm -hmm. um, do we want to, as Scott was alluding to, try to make sure those guys continue to work and have interoperability by potentially updating the spec? Because if we're going to do an SDK demo interop thing, and if we do interop on, say, version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.3, if there's something flat out wrong in the spec, should we update it? Or as Clemens was suggesting, do we say, no, these are all working drafts and we're only going to do interrupt testing on the latest one. And if you have an implementation of anything older, well, you're on your own. Lots of options here. Personally, I My think it's... Before... I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead, Dan, say that again. My preference before 1.0 is that uh, we treat these all as beta and they won't necessarily be interoperable. Um, been the same way with most of the uh, um, Apache projects I've worked with on in the past. Uh, Thrift is an example of that. Uh, that it was annoying when they would switch, but we knew what we were doing. Um, we knew that we chose a a beta version, a pre 1.0 version. Okay, thank you, Dan. Scott, were you going to say something in there? I was. I was thinking it may not be that bad to go back and correct the. 01 and 02 versions of the bindings for HTTP binary mode. Because it's not like it's the core of the spec. It's one particular encoding type for one particular transport. It definitely is an option. Yep. What do people think? Do we want to do this? I've heard opinions of both sides. <laughs> My preference as someone trying to use the spec is that at the very least there's a note in the spec itself saying this isn't accurate and you should do this instead because looking at an older version of the spec as a lot of our things emit 0.1, um, I, I shouldn't have to have kind of uh, arcane knowledge for, oh, ignore this particular part. I, I want to be able to look at the spec and immediately see what is correct. So I guess in terms of old versions of the spec, I, I think they're being there are two options there if we, if we decide to do something. One is actually fix the, fix the spec proper and create a 0 0.1.1, 0 0.2.2, and 0 0.3.1. So that funky in there, but you don't know what I meant. Add a dot three to the minor version number. Or add a note that says we're not updating the spec, but 
remove the quotes. It was a typo, but we didn't want to take on the burden of modifying this, the, the full spec. Those are both valid options, even though that- Both are fine with me as long as it's easy when I'm looking at the older versions of the spec to know where those notes are exist and that I have to read them. Yeah. Of course, you got to wonder if we're going to go in there and touch the spec at all, would it just be just as easy as to fix it? <laughs> right. So before before we, we think about this, I'm not, now that I read, read through this in parallel, um, I'm not convinced that the spec is wrong. Well, I think according to the spec, it's probably 100% accurate because I think the spec talks about adjacent encoding. Right? Yes. And, and, and um, it, because I actually make the difference between, between the cloud events fields that are encoded um, and they have the quotes if they're strings and then they have, effectively they're using JSON encoding all the way, which is then correct with quotes because I have other fields which are not, which are mapped effectively natively, like content type is mapped explicit to, explicitly to an HTTP field. Um, and then that is of course unquoted because that's what the norm, the normal uh, uh, format for content type is. So my question again, what from that curl example, um, where did that bug come from? But a header is already a string. So if you, quote that no but but it's it's it, it's a string that contains like all of json is a string right but values are representing either strings or numbers um or booleans and so that's the that's how json distinguishes that JSON well not, quotes, not all of json is a string well json json is a string encoded Right, so like if you take the CE type example that the cursor is on, to mm -hmm. encode that in as it sits right now in the spec, it would have to be quote, quote, well, quote, and then escape quote, com dot example dot some event, escape quote, quote, quote. No. Uh, unless I misunderstand how headers work. So. It, here, here's what the spec, the spec says. HTTP header values. The value for each HTTP header is constructed from the respective JSON value representation compliant with the JSON event format specification. There is, and then there's more, but there's no rule that is further saying anything about, um, um, about quotes. Well, Clement, I'm not sure I'm following what you're saying. Are you saying that this example is correct or incorrect? Uh, the, let me switch back. This example that we have here is correct per spec. But is that really what we want to do? Because people, I believe, will pick up the quotes as part of the value itself. So there the question is, if we allow for extensions, one second. Um, C compare co content type with CE type. So, 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 sorry, my, my, my phone was getting in the way of my headphones. Um, if we want to allow for um, arbitrary extensions to pass through HTTP, we need to allow for um, a new, a numbers because we just added them uh, and for strings to be encoded which, needs to, which means we need to make the difference because otherwise we can't decode them anymore. So we made the rule to say, we're basing, we're basing this on JSON. And so JSON is the way how those strings, the, the header value is to be interpreted. You run it through, you, you read those through a JSON decoder. And the infer type is what you get. But, uh, that doesn't, that's not how the internet works most of the time. I mean, like you, you get the value of the header and then it's a string already. And you're, you're saying t to quote the string again, again. No, we have, a, we have a type system that we define for cloud events. And these are attributes of cloud events 
that we carry through HTTP headers. And we infer the type of a field, which is not well known, but is an extension on the other side. We infer that through the JSON translation. But if you remove the technical hat that you're wearing, Clemens, mm -hmm. you have to admit, this is just funky. No. I mean, <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. Because literally, Jason, J if you look, take a look at Jason, that's what Jason does. I, I, I understand that. But, but like I said, you have to remove your technical hat for a second and look at it from somebody looking at this with a fresh set of eyes. They're going to look at this and say, oh, someone by mistake put quotes around stuff. Obviously, these are all strings. Type, you know, time, ID, those are all just strings. Look, the quotes, there must be a typo. Everybody assumed that as we were writing the spec, and we're experts in this. Um, I mean, we, we can we can drop them. I I need to effective. I need them to wordsmith effectively an exclusion clause there in the spec that says um, if. So what's the distinction now between a field that carries a number, like the the sequence this our sequence extension and um, a, um, a field that carries a string. Right, I, I guess I kind of assume that if, if, we, if we were gonna fix this, that we would basically, for all the well-known types, we know how to encode those HTTP headers already. And you're gonna know what the value is, so when you, when you decode it, you know whether it's a number or a string already. For extensions in general, it seems to me you could say if you don't know what the extension is because it's just a random extension to you and you don't actually have a formal support for it to know whether it's a number or a string, treat it as a string. Okay. Yeah. So I'll I'll write. I'm I'm okay. I'm okay with with writing the uh, um, writing the, writing the clause that basically clarifies that and gets rid of the quotes. Okay. Well, but okay. So I know Scott, you're probably okay with that direction. What do other people think on the call? Much as I hate to say, I can see where Clemens was coming from when he wrote this, because I, I would like to sort of understand how you would pass a context attribute that's numeric, not a string, and have it work all the way through a pipeline. Well, the, the pipeline doesn't have to care because it's just a header, and it's data it, all the way through. And if it does understand it, then it knows how to interpret that, that string of bytes. Well, I think... Uh, and I don't want to put words in Clement's mouth, but I, I think if you started off with an event that had a context attribute that was a, a number, and then it got encoded like this, when well, it got to the other end, and someone then tried to move it onto a different transport or turn it back into a JSON document, um, without these markers, you don't know how to map it back again. You don't know whether to turn it into a, a JSON number or a JSON string. Correct. You lose the type information. You lose the type information. And uh, uh, so th this is really funky. Uh, and I was just looking at the AMQP spec because this would apply across the board on all of the transport specs. Yeah. So the issue really is how do you, how do you communicate the type of a attribute of an yeah. attribute? MQP is different because the properties there are typed, which means you literally take in an integer and map this to an integer in MQP, and you take a string and map it to a string in MQP, and you don't lose the, the type information uh, there. But, but I, think they, I think they have a map to application properties, which are all strings. Yeah, so um, you have the same problem, I believe. No, it's a string keyed. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. properties. Yeah, properties can be can be typed. Can be typed. Okay. I, all right. I will try. But but but, Jem, does it not address your concern if we say things that are of <clears throat> unknown types, like for example, extensions, are just treated as strings, and it's only people who understand those particular extensions that they they'll convert into something different? Well, then wouldn't you say those extensions must be strings? They can't be anything other than strings. Otherwise, you've got an interop problem. Yeah. So you change the spec rather than the transport binding. I don't know. I'd have to think about that one because I was kind of assuming that if you don't know what it is, treating it as a string isn't that big of a deal because even if it's a JSON blob, you can still treat it as a string. And then somebody who wants to actually process, 
process that thing will know, oh, this is JSON, because that's what the definition of that extension means, or it says, and I'm going to decode it as JSON. I think what we're, what we're putting into question here is really, can we have any data types that data type in cloud events that is not string because the, removing the codes means everything is a string now. Or we treat the, the spec level fields differently than extensions. That we could do that. So my, my, what I've been trying to do, my intent here was to um, have a type safe mapping of the, the, the information model of cloud events onto HTTP headers in a reversible way so that the, the, the receiver would be able to go in and uh, restore effectively the same types using JSON uh, type inference. That was, that was the goal of that. Yeah, and I definitely appreciate the goal. It just feels like technical purity is, has, has bumped into reality. In a bad way. <laughs> Unfortunately. How do our SDKs work today? Do they honor this? No, at least not the Go one. And if any of the others interoperate with Go, they don't either. My guess is no one even noticed the culture there. So, Clement, it sounds like you volunteered to take this one, but you may want to do some more thinking about it. Um, mm -hmm. Is that fair for you to go off and do that thinking? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. If, but the, the other question that, um, that came up was, okay, what do we do about the old specs? I don't think we can answer that question yet until Clemens comes back with a proposal that we all agree to. Because we may come back and say, no, it, it's, it's perfect the way it is. And at that point, we don't need to touch the old specs. So I think we need to wait on that decision. Does that sound right? Okay, I'm gonna assume you guys agree. Okay, anything else related to this issue we need to discuss? Adam, did we miss anything? No, I think that's it. I just want clarity on which is the correct one and then hopefully the SDKs match whatever the decision is. Yep, and thank you very much for bringing this up. It's a good one. All right. Um, we may have time for at least a quick talk about this one. So there's a bit of a, on, a, <clears throat> on an old phone call, someone asked what does optional actually mean uh, for receivers of cloud events? And uh, I think Clemens, you basically said optional means optional to send and optional to handle. Um, does everybody agree with that general direction? Because I think we should probably add some clarity to the spec since this question has come up, I think, more than once. Yeah, so I mean, I think the comments here are uh, in line with my thinking. Um, I, I sort of was questioning the term optional to handle, which I think is what Clemens added. I, but I think if we can agree that, you know, middle, middlemen have to pass those optional things on, even if they don't understand them. Um, I, think, um, I think that's really what the intent was. Yeah. Okay. Is anybody who disagrees with the general direction, things like optional to send, optional to handle, intermediaries must propagate, which I feel like actually goes a little bit beyond the question of optionality, but still a good thing to probably put somewhere in the spec since that has come up more than once. Anybody disagree with that general direction? Isn't propagation one way of handling? So why would one be optional to handle it, but still have to propagate? How can you, um, if a middleware doesn't support, doesn't understand, there will be a header coming through so from some extension, it will just drop it. So how can be optional to handle it? Uh, they uh, must propagate, uh, that doesn't sound right to me. That's an interesting question. So, so those yeah. extensions would propagate, yeah, because uh, uh, I was going to test my spec knowledge here. <laughs> extensions have to be prefixed with CE, don't they? So you, you can no, look at don't. the you can look, they don't? I thought you could look at the header set. And Currently there's it. this trace uh, one, and if it just has trace as prefixes, I could see. 
Yeah, I think it, I don't know where, but there's some, some conversation about this where we talked about how maybe we should add text that says, if you don't prefix your extensions with dash CE, um, I'm sorry, CE dash, then you run the risk of them being dropped by intermediaries because they have no idea they're cloud events headers. All right, cool. But, but, um, uh, Steve-O, do you think that the cloud event extensions that have the CE dash prefix can be dropped by intermediaries? Yeah, I, I didn't know there's a special treatment and there's uh, uh, different uh, sets, so CE and non-CE. I, I didn't notice that uh, in the spec. So this has certainly some impact on the PR I'm supposed to prepare regarding the immutability of the event context. There, there was a consensus, uh, I think, that uh, we shouldn't impose too strict rules. And uh, I mean, removing uh, an attribute is uh, maybe an extreme form of modifying it. So um, if we uh, say here must, then this would also impact this rule. I'm surprised, Clemens, you haven't spoken up. I think you have some strong opinions on this one, right? Well, my opinion is right there. Uh, wait. Or, or what, what were you referring to? No, we're, to? we're talking about this line right here. Oh, yeah. I, I, that's always my assumption that it, it, whatever an intermediary gets, it must propagate. Unless, Even... unless, 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 unless it's directed at it. <laughs> so for so for instance, a uh, the tracing extension is probably pr targeted at every at every intermediary if you do that sort of tracing, which means um, that's an optional attribute. But the intermediary may want to go and futz with it because it wants to go and add its own context. Uh, Clemens, I think this is a really good point. Um, I feel that the intermediaries must propagate and really, unless it is directed to them, then they have the freedom to modify and possibly even remove it. Yes. We should link this, this uh, issue to that, the one that was talking about the immutability of the context. Because I think they're related. Yeah, I think that's what Klaus was saying, yeah. Oh, yes. okay, sorry, sorry. So I do feel like, the, the, unfortunately, we, we actually merged two issues together. At least in my head, there are two issues. issues. I, I think the optionality thing is different than the forwarding thing. Klaus, would you want to take a, would you want to take the responsibility of including this part of, of this discussion in your PR that you're going to write up? Yeah, I'm just wondering how to handle it. I mean, uh, so far the direction for my PR was to just add some guidelines into the primer. And this uh, well, must and capital letters somehow um, um, directs more to the, in, yeah, for the spec. So do we have to add something to the spec or is it also want, just for the primer? Well, if we want normative language, it has to go in the spec, yeah. If people, <clears throat> if the group wants that must in all caps, then yes. We may need text either in both places or the, all the text that you're proposing to go into the spec. It's, it's kind of up to you. Okay, so I can try to, to come up with a proposal and then we can see. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so on this one, is there somebody who'd like to volunteer to write up this piece of it? Optional, this, what optional actually means. Okay, not hearing anybody. I'll take that one since I was the one to open up this issue. So hold on. I might as well forget if I don't do it right now. Oops. Okay. All right. I think that, that I don't think we have time to talk about anything additional additional on today's call. So let's quickly do the final roll call thing. Uh, so don't vanish yet. Um, Roberto. I'm here, there. Doug. Excellent. Thank you. 
Uh, Mehmet, are you there? Mehmet from Verizon? Okay, what about Vladimir? I'm here, thank you. Hi, I am. Oh, Mehmet, okay, got you, thank you. Um, David Baldwin. David Baldwin, you there? Yep, still here. Still here. Excellent, cool. Uh, Richard? Hello, yep, I'm here. Hello. Uh, Christian? Right here, hello. Okay, and Matt, are you there? I'm here. Okay, thank you. And Christian, your, your question, yes, the recording should be available. I think it takes about a week or so for the guys to, to do that, but it should be on the uh, web, website soon. Is there anybody on the call that I missed for the attendance? All right, in that case, I believe we are done for the day. Thank you guys very much, and we'll talk right. next time. Thanks, have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah.